everybody, welcome back to Small Talk Japan. On this show, we talk about all things Japan in English. My name is Michi and these are my co-hosts. Natsuki. And Alex, hello. Hey guys, so today we're going to talk about a really, really kind of like, it's going to be, I don't know how deep we're going to go with the subject, but it's going to be about, is Japan ready for global workers? So basically, Natsuki is going to represent Japan. <laughs> hello <and> Japan. <laughs> we're going to represent the global workers. Okay. <laughs> so today, you know, I got the American flag. Just trying to represent. Oh, shoot. I should wear my <laughs> white and red thing. <laughs> You're the Japanese soccer team, football team. Oh, yeah. right, right, blue, right, right. Blue right. and oh, yeah. Samurai blue. blue. There you Samurai go. blue, okay. okay. Oh, dear, man. It's all right. So uh, let's get right into it. First of all, um, I think that for, you know, hundreds of years, Japan as a country, historically, during the isolation period, right, you had the whole country cut off from the outside world. And you had one culture, one language for the most part, okay? I mean, yes, there were some regional differences in everything, but for the most part, one culture, one language, one people kind of thing. Suddenly, Japan becomes a global society, especially post-war, after the war. And they start doing business with all over the world. And then now with the population shrink, it's a great time to invite in so those sort of global workers, mm. right? Is the country ready? Let's first start with what it was like a decade ago, Alex, when you first got here. So, because you, you're you're my sampa, you got here before I did. Yeah, but I mean, the the kind of place that we arrived in, you yeah. know, because we were on the jet program, so we were ALTs, yeah. is a little bit different to working in a company. Okay, that's fair. So, you know, like the the school system is kind of ready for this because they've done it a couple of times already. Yeah. So by the time we joined, Jet was like 15, maybe 16 years old, I think, already. I think maybe 20 by that more point. More than that, yeah. Yeah, maybe. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so they've done it, you know, more than 10 times at least, yeah. you know, in that cycle. So they kind of knew what to expect from the foreign people. Okay. Um, but it seems they hadn't changed how to deal with them, right? So you're sat in a classroom... You know, you're not given any work to do. You're not given any responsibilities. You're just there. Yeah, you're just there. Yeah. You're not given advice. You know, it's just like, do your thing, foreign person. Did you feel like you were part of the team and collaborating with everybody? Or did you feel like an island to yourself? on the Oh, show? an island to myself. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, people try to involve us, but, you know, it, it's always, they just kind of default back to the group, right? Yeah. And it's very difficult to kind of get in that and, and talk, especially if you don't have the language skill. So uh. at first I didn't speak Japanese. So, you know, that was tough. Language is a huge factor. I think that even even when you're in the larger cities in Tokyo and stuff like that, when you say like, "Oh, I work for," we we talked. Well, we we talk about this company sometimes, Rack Ten, who has like a, a policy of everybody should have a certain. I think it's eight hundred on the TOEIC. They want everybody to get eight, maybe it's seven, eight hundred. I think it is. Yeah. Um. So they want the whole company to speak English. But even in a company like that, uh, I bet you if you walk into a corporate headquarters and start talking to people, isn't your corporate headquarters right next to the Rack Ten building? No? Different? No. no. Anyway, you walk in there, like, there's going to be people who can't speak English, right? And so language barrier is a problem. And then there's also kind of pushback against English, too. There's like, well, this is Japan, they should speak Japanese, which that's fair. You know, that there's people who believe that. There's no, I don't believe that, but, you know, people who believe that, there's, that's a fair thing to say. I mean, the reason why we are, like, now, compared to 10 years ago, you see a lot more foreign people around, right? And they tend to be doing more diverse jobs than just teaching English. Mm. So one of the first things people ask you is... <laughs> Where do you teach English? Yeah, where do you teach English is number one. Mm. And number two, when are you going home? And it's like, well, what, what, how do you make this conclusion? <laughs> yeah. yeah, they. Uh, yeah. I get this less now, but before, especially when you're out drinking, they'd be like, people would be like, oh, did you just get here today? I'm like, yeah, yeah. if you add 10 years to today. Yeah. And they're like, oh, when are you going home? I'm like, um, do you want me to leave now? I mean, yeah. should I go? <laughs> I mean, often it's not like in a negative way. It's just curiosity. Yeah, honestly, kind of they're just... They, naivety, right? Right, they're just trying to... But it, they don't understand how it makes us feel like, oh, mm. should we go home kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's diversifying. You know, you see people 
people, you know, from mm. many different countries now. So that's good. Natsuki, you graduated university and became as known as shakaijin, like a, you know, a, a, like a, a person who's like a worker. Like, you mm. know, mm. how many years ago? 20 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Oh, no, 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 no. 15 years 15 ago. years. 15 years. Yeah. In 15 years, mm -hmm. how many times have you worked for a company or in a situation where there were foreign people? Zero. 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 Actually, you're the first person that I know of who worked for the, like, not school or not English school. Do you right. understand what I mean? Like, normal company. Right. right. So you're the first person. Right. Congratulations, Alex. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> good on me yeah so you know it's the the amount the the, the idea of having non-japanese people work in a normal corporate uh, uh uh you know situation atmosphere is changing in tokyo for sure but it's still not a normal thing throughout the country here right, i mean right. even, even in tokyo though, to be honest with you i mean like you've got a lot of geishke like foreign companies yeah. in tokyo and they have a lot of foreign staff obviously yeah uh, and some of the more kind of international japanese companies will have foreign people working for them as well but it's a rarity to find people really deep in the Japanese system mm. yeah. of work. Just because the barriers to entry are so high, right? Yeah. If you can't read, write, and speak Japanese fluently, mm. first you've got zero chance. Yeah. You know, absolutely zero. Um, and then after that, you know, working yourself into the complex network of relationships within the company and finding your own space is also very tough. So uh, Let's talk about that a little bit. Interpersonal relationships within an office setting in Japan mm -hmm. can be, I think you, I think we could do like, like multiple PhDs worth of study on this because right. it's so deep and so interesting. Recently, you know, there's a lot of things that are changing. For example, they have Pawahara and Aruhara, so power mm -hmm. harassment and al alcohol ra harassment. Yeah. But back in the day, maybe 10 years ago or something like that, it was like the old boys club. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Right? You go out drinking with your senpai, he bullies you, you guys go to like a girls club afterwards, and this is how you got business done in Japan. Um, and that's really hard if you are, let's say that you come from a Muslim country where, you know, alcohol is, is, is not in your culture. It's not mm -hmm. something that you want to do. You don't want to drink. Mm -hmm. That's going to be difficult for you. If you don't have the, the language ability um, to keep up in those kind of drinking situations, it's going to be really difficult for you. Yeah. And then that outside of the 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 like um company like uh, uh situations that kind of like extracurricular stuff then turns around and bleeds back into the the, yeah. the corporate set, the set setting so you actually see this um uh, there's a documentary on netflix called um it's about like video games or something and this guy i think who brought nintendo to europe uh, he's giving his interview about this uh, i've seen this yeah. and he said that he go he went i think he's swedish actually or something like that he's from some non he's not from england he's some I think, North, nordic country goes and meets the guy the at nintendo and says you know, he, they make all the, they, they wheel and deal all the stuff back in the 80s. And then they go, okay, now that that's all decided, let's go to dinner. Mm -hmm. And then they go to dinner and they start drinking and then everything gets renegotiated over drinks. Mm -hmm. So the, everything that they decided when they were sober in the company doesn't mean anything. It's, mm -hmm. it's afterwards, it's the drinking time that everything counts. Mm -hmm. And that court, that's the old style, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's still some companies still run themselves that way, but that's the old style now that's kind of changing. But if you're a foreign person who doesn't drink alcohol or can't really keep up with the, the Japanese or you don't have a translator, that's hard to do. Mm. Yeah. I mean, people don't like things that are too business-like here Yeah. Uh, in a weird way because Japanese people are very business-like yeah. and very serious, you know, about punctuality and, um, you know, content of meetings and things like that. And everything's, you know, recorded and, you know, arranged in advance or whatever. But, um, I mean, my boss was a, a banker formerly. Mm. And he said to me once that there was a, an offer from a proposal for an American company, a proposal from a Japanese company about some kind of system redesign for the bank. Mm. And he said the American company had this really great proposal. It made loads of sense. Mm -hmm. You know, the price point was fine. Uh, and it looked like it would work really well. But when they came to the office, they only talk about business. Mm. so they weren't like how's it going and things like that and talking to them they just literally brought the proposal out went through it and told them the benefits of it yeah. mm. a Japanese company came in with a proposal that wasn't quite as good mm. and it was about the same price mm. but the guy would come in and go oh how's the kids you know oh how was golf last weekend oh. uh, let's just have a cup of tea and they would chat for the whole time mm. and then the last five minutes he would just like oh yeah and that proposal thing yeah if you want to consider us uh, and by the way should we go out for a drink later on Japanese company got the deal, mm. you know. Yeah. Even though the American proposal was better on paper, mm. yeah. for them, the long-term relationship mm. going forwards, mm, mm, mm. it seemed like the Japanese side cared more about them personally. 
That's a really good point you just brought up there, Alex, is the long-term relationship that a lot of Japanese companies really want to, to make with other business B2B partnerships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, you know this as well, Natsuki, like you have clients that, you know, have been using your, your company for probably many, many, many years. Mm. And keeping that relationship with those clients is very, very important. I mean, this is true anywhere, but I think especially in Japan, that mm. personable relationship with those people. Right, mm. right, right. And right. the reason why is probably because when they had a problem with something, they can easily talk us about that. Uh, they, yeah. they have that, that point man that they can contact and say, right. here's our problem. Right, right. So then, yes, yeah. it's easy, How easy, do you say that? It's easy to con- consult with and negotiate. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, that's maybe the point that Japanese company got to deal with it. Another mm-hmm. funny thing is the contracts. There aren't mm-hmm. that many contracts. And even then, you if they I mean? do have a contract, contracts, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not, a lo- I'm not a lawyer. Don't take my advice. But contracts, even if you have one, they don't mean much. Yeah. I mean, there are so many times where I've had a contract and they're like, yeah, we just didn't write it down. Can you do this anyways? And I'm like, yeah, it's not in the contract. And then like you could tell that if I said no to this, that this would burn the bridge forever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. America is such a litigious society that like if it's not in the contract, we're not doing it. Yeah. yeah. Like we didn't agree to that. You know, so that, that does bleed into work as well, though, because then your responsibility at work, like if there's a job that you have to do that isn't in your job description, generally in the West, you won't do it. But in Japan, you just expect it to pitch in with everybody else. You said right? something that was really interesting to me the other day. Like after the typhoons came here last year, you and all the staff, no matter what your rank was, got out in the garden because you work for Sengai yeah. and uh, the, the World Heritage Site, the gardens here. Mm-hmm. You guys all went out there and started cleaning it up. Yeah. Like, it's like the group, group collected. Let's get out there and do that. That's yeah. probably not in your contract to clean the gardens. No. Uh, <laughs> three days, man. Uh, clean up, yeah. Chainsaw, you know, cutting wood up and stuff like that. But now it was, speak, it was fun, speak, speak to that as, you know, like what? are the benefits of doing that like you know well i, ha- I have a question uh, so if like you know polling like person who work for a japanese company and then nanka soji toka ga contract ni notte nakatta ba so if it's if the you know cleaning and stuff like that's not in their contract okay it depends on the person obviously but for the most part out west when you have uh like it, let's say you get a programmer at google they're not cleaning the toilets oh uh, but but i mean in that situation somebody won't do it in in japan or in, in- in, UK. in like UK or let's say UK. So uh, I, I it's think not on contrast, so I won't do it. Uh, yeah, that might happen. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm. I mean, so I mean, they it, would it discuss. On, yeah, it depends on the person. Yeah, um, if it's a natural disaster and everybody's pitching in, I think it's going to be okay. But okay. like, if it's like suddenly like, oh, we're firing our cleaning cl- crew. By the way, none of you guys have in your contract that you you have to clean the toilets. Now everybody's cleaning the toilets. Yeah, there'll be pushback. Um, be like, no, that's not in my job description. I'm not cleaning toilets. I but see. in Japan, it's like, well, work starts at nine. By the way, come in at eight o'clock and let's all clean up. Yeah, mm. and it's like a non-verbal thing, mm, mm, mm. an understanding, you know, through. Let's talk about time. That's that's not a thing that I mean. I I like the concept of a salaried worker. So you pay them a salary, you give them uh, objectives, and then they just do what they need to do. Yeah. But in Japan, they like the idea of hourly workers. Like there's no such rule. I don't think you can actually hire somebody as being just completely salaried. But like they have this thing, I like hourly workers or something like that. And like in that case, like you, they they give you a schedule. Like here are your hours that you work. By the way, we're gonna ask you to work outside of those hours, but we're not gonna pay you for it. Yeah, mm. yeah. Service is angular, yeah. Yeah, and it's like what you just said is like you know free overtime. It's like yeah. a huge thing in Japan, and like I can understand why because they they have a shrinking workforce, they need the labor, but at the same time, that doesn't that kill innovation? Mm. So for us, I mean, if you want to do overtime, you have to apply for it, and then okay. it gets processed by your boss or whatever. But yeah. if you're in management level, you don't get overtime pay at all. Yeah. So I I, I don't get any overtime. Um, but it's weird. It's like you can come in super early. You come in at 6 a.m. like every day, voluntarily early to clean up or to do some extra work or something like that. Nobody bats an eyelid, right? Uh, if you stay at night time till like 10 p.m. or whatever doing something, it's nobody you know has a problem with that. If you're one minute late in the morning, <laughs> like they just go nuts on you. And it's like <laughs> yesterday I worked till midnight. You know, can I come in late? No, you know no. you've got to come in at the decided time. Mm. No matter what you did the day before. Um, and our company's changing a lot actually We're, the really good thing about the place I work at is that um, the top level management and the CEO go home at 5.30 on the dot mm. like every day um, so he's planned you, his work day out so well can you speak to that why is that important for the, the top level management in a Japanese company to go, on, go home on time because then the employees below them feel that they can also go home mm. they won't go home if the top people don't go no, home no if you go home before somebody above you senior to you seen as being kind of a bit rude because they might still be working you yeah. might have been able to help them with something mm. yeah. or if they needed you but you've gone home mm. you know you're you know, creating bad 
face for them yeah. and inconvenience in them as well. So it's important for people higher up to go home earlier so that everybody else can go home. Mm. The problem is when you get one dude who stays behind, like middle management. And everybody sits there. And everybody's just kind of sat there, you know. There's so much nonverbal communication in Japan that like, especially in an in open office setting, because people don't have their own cubicles and stuff like that. It's like open. Yeah. Actually, it's almost militaristic the way that they have these, these set up. They, you have all these desks set up like this. And then at the very end, you have like the, the top manager who looks at you from the side mm. yeah. to make sure that you're doing your job. It's such a toxic arrangement, I feel, mm. but like. I mean, you get used to it. When I first walked into that open plan office and saw it, I was like, oh, oh my God, what have I done? Yeah. Like, oh, I'm trapped here now. But it's not that bad, you know, really. If you're chatting to people around you a little bit about things. I think that we are in a so, less pressure environment than say Tokyo or Osaka or something like that. I think that true. we would hate doing that in yeah, Tokyo. That is true, yeah. But I mean, at the same time though, it, it does promote some conversation yeah. in the workplace. But the funny thing is, people in Japan never talk about their private lives ever at work. Just really unusual. It's like when you get in in Britain, you come after the weekend, right? Yeah. What did you guys do this weekend? Yeah, what did you do the weekend? How's the kids doing? Whatever. None of that. Mm. So it's all completely cut off. Yeah. Which I always find very strange, you know. Natsuki, in your environment, you know, you're just all Japanese people. What do you guys talk about? I mean, obviously the last year has been different, but like when it's normal time, I mean, what do you guys talk about in the, in the office? Do you talk? We talk, but like we make time to chat. Oh, okay. Like before the meeting, we say like break up time, and then we talk about our weekend or like things that we did. Some break time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But like you said, if we don't make time, we don't chat a lot much mm. because it's nothing related to our work. Yeah. You know, do you understand what I mean? Mm. So you have a point. What mm. What if somebody in your company and here's a, here's the million dollar question? Let's say that they they produce the most, they have the highest sales, they are the best worker but they consistently come in 20 minutes late every day everything about them on paper is the best okay they highest sales really nice person everything but they always come into work 20 minutes late uh to be honest my company have a flex time so uh, it's okay to come late but like like the like normal company traditional company, yeah, traditional company he is Bad. Or yeah, see. They'll or they'll, bad. they'll they'll fire their their highest performing mm -hmm. yeah. staff if they're like I was saying one or two minutes late consistently every single day. And I look at that, I'm like, I don't care if this person's late. If they're my highest performer, go yeah. them. Let them work on oh, whatever they want to work. That's true. Like when I was twenties, twenty two or three, at the time my company was still like be the time on the time. Do you understand what I mean? So my senpai got office like one minute late. And then my boss made him go home. Really? Yeah, really? Yeah. Wow. It's like, a, I, I thought it looks like an army. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's like a tw 10 years ago story, though. I think it's changing, though. I mean, the mm -hmm. thing with, I mean, because we're talking about foreign people working here now, mm. uh, it, it is slightly different if you're a foreigner in a Japanese office as well. Because first, when they hire you, you know, Japanese people tend to come in after graduating from university or whatever or from mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. and then they do this like shisho kakatsu do mm -hmm. lots of uh, job hunting yeah mm -hmm. get employed mm -hmm. and japanese companies traditionally are set up so that it's not what you can do for the company mm -hmm. it's what the company can do for you to, to raise you up as a person so they'll right? educate mm -hmm. you you yeah. know they'll send you to different departments and build mm -hmm. your skill set right right whatever um and when a foreigner comes in who's not been through the school system in the same way. And maybe has a specialization. Or is very specialized already. It's like, what do we do with you? <laughs> Where do you go? Mm. So a lot of places struggle with finding the right role, especially in a traditional office environment. Yeah. That's maybe um, true. Bosses don't know how to deal with, you know, yeah. those people. because the, They're, they're very back, specialized. Yeah, yeah, background is very different. Yeah. So they don't know how to do it. So in my experience, there are basically two approaches in a Japanese company, right? Okay. And one is... A, try and make them into a Japanese person. Mm -hmm. So they, what they do is try and fit a square peg into a round hole. I think that if you're bringing in, I'm sorry, I think if you're bringing in global talent, mm -hmm. the worst thing you can do is, all right, let's make you into everybody else that we already have here. Yeah. What's, so, what's the point of doing that? So that's bad management, right? right. So essentially, you know, they're just going to become an underperforming Japanese person, yeah, even we, if you succeed. We right? talked about this before. Yeah. You and I speak Japanese, but we speak Japanese like an idiot Japanese person. Yeah. We're never going to well, be... Well, I don't, but... We're, no, you, you we're, never, we're never, never going to be like a college professor Japanese 
college professional level of Japanese. Yeah. We're going to make mistakes. We're not going to say things correctly every time. Just like when we, you know, when professors from China or from India give, you know, speeches and stuff like that, sometimes their English is a little wonky. Yeah. yeah. But we realize that these people are PhDs and geniuses. And it doesn't matter if their English is kind of screwed up. They're they're very smart. So we should listen to what they're trying to say. Yeah. In Japan, what happens, and it's just a natural reaction, is sometimes when we we have a great idea, because we screw up the, the, the communication of that idea a little bit, they're like... <laughs> You're like a 14, 12 year old or something. You can't talk. Yeah. And then they just disregard your idea, which mm. happens frequently. That mm. does happen, actually. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you can get dismissed quite easily. You said, I'm not a stupid Japanese person. I'm a really smart Englishman, is what you said to me. And yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Like your ability to, to, to take your culture, your ideas, and then, and, then, and then implement that in a different language, environments, and a different cultural environment doesn't make you a lower form of the people in this environment. Right. Well, <laughs> like, as a foreign employee as well, you've got to know when to switch it on and when to switch it off right so the, the, I used to think I had to speak Japanese all the time uh, like in the work environment right when you have the opportunity to speak English if you're working with a Japanese person who speaks English you should use English because yeah. you're going to dominate the conversation then well as a, and, as a, as a, a tactic right yeah and also for you know you can sound much more eloquent and yeah. allow them to understand that you've got a level of intelligence higher than might be you yeah. know expressed in Japanese or whatever so when I'm dealing with like um, things like embassy staff mm. or you know people who work for international companies in Tokyo, mm. I tend to default to English now. But that's good Japanese. though. I mean, yeah. it's, it's also like I'm I'm okay with if they if I know that they're bilingual. If I express myself in English and they express themselves in Japanese, that's totally fine with me. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like the Star Wars method of communicating with people. Yeah, Everybody yeah. just speaks their own language and yeah. somehow it works out. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. you know that's fine. Well, I do like to send a very nice uh, Kegel email at the start just to, <laughs> just to let them know that I can speak their language pretty, pretty damn well already. Thank you very much. Um, I would suggest another thing that we don't necessarily have to deal with so much, and this is kind of a growing problem in Japan, is that especially global workers that are from non-English speaking countries or maybe mm-hmm. other Asian countries and stuff like that, Actually, there are not this, not everywhere. Okay, it, it really depends on the situation. But sometimes there's like a uh, an arrogance about the Japanese employer that looked down upon workers from other countries. Now, I want to talk about this in context of our home countries because I think that this is a problem in America. Yeah, I think that when we have especially Latino uh, immigration from you know Mexico and places like that. I think that there is kind of an arrogance to English speaking, especially white Americans, yeah. towards mm-hmm. these workers mm-hmm. that is really bad mm. you know and i'm wondering yeah. i'm wondering about in england i mean is there is there for those like you know kind of low skilled immigrant workers that come in is yeah. there is there that kind of treatment of them i think in england the main key um now obviously historically there was a lot of discrimination yeah um, the main key now is whether you speak english or not um, and whether you speak english well yeah. if you don't speak english really well nobody's going to give you the time of day um, you just, you'll never get a job you know in an office environment or something like that um, so that's the kind of basic level yeah um unless obviously you're really good at a particular skill you know you've got some kind of specialist skill that nobody else can do yeah that might be a different situation um in japan it seems sometimes they're willing to hire people who don't speak Japanese because they've got this, you know, image that Japanese is this super hard language. Well, it is. You know. It is rare that people around the world choose to to learn Japanese. Yeah. yeah, compared to like English or Chinese, it's Japanese is. I think. I mean, I don't have the data on this, but if you if you Google it, I'm sure it's it's lower on the list than yeah. other yeah, languages. Yeah. So you know, it's it's got a reputation for being hard. Yeah. I mean, whether it is or not, so kanji is not discussion. easy. It's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy, but it's doable. It, know, it just it's, takes it's not, time. Yeah, it just takes a bit of time. It's like yeah. going to the gym. If you if you do it all the time, you get a great body. Anybody can do it. Yeah. But do people go to the gym and get a great body? Do you have the motivation? Right. right. You know. Um. So th- those hurdles are there. That does make it a bit more difficult. But Japanese people are, tend to be more forgiving than they would be in the West. Yeah, that's you know, true. If you're in England and you're speaking like broken English, trying yeah. to do an office job, mm. and you're on the phone, people are going to get annoyed. At you. Mm. <laughs> you know, I, I think that going to that culturally, especially if we, may, I mean, like now we, we we get the culture, but when we first got here, like you know, for example, uh, standing on what's it called the zabuton? What's it mm. called the cushion? Yeah, yeah. If you stand on that, right, that's like a super social faux pas. Mm. And so, like sometimes, you know, like the, they'll just kind of give you a little push, like, hey, don't do that. Yeah. And then afterwards, they'll just like kindly explain it to you like that. I don't think that you'd get. Nah, it depends on the American. But some of the Americans, if if the if the you know person, the fish out of water, is doing something that's socially like you know taboo in America, I think they just get angry at them. The, the mm. thing is, right here, the, there won't be any direct confrontation, right? Oh. Generally, 
So it all goes round in a big circle. <laughs> I had this right once. So when I was in ALT, um, when I came here, I was a bit fatter than I am now. I'm getting, getting back there. I now. saw the pictures. Yeah. I can confirm. Not a lot. I told his just, wife, I told Alex's bit. wife at their house, I said, you did a great job on him. <laughs> yeah. She said, disho, which means, isn't that right? Come on. <laughs> but I'm getting back there now, actually. But uh, <laughs> After the holidays. Yeah, I know. Oh, I got to lose some weight. But... Um, you know, I, I bought some trousers or whatever. Yeah. So I got in shape quite quite a lot, actually, back then. And, like, the trousers are too big, so they hang down a tiny bit, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the teachers at the school didn't like it. Look looked like you're sagging. So, like, kind of saggy trousers on. He yeah, thought yeah. it wasn't mm -mm. cool to do that. Yeah. So he told uh, the head teacher. <laughs> so the head teacher then... Playing phoned, giant game of telephone, yeah. Phoned uh, the Board of Education. Okay. And the Board of Education department head phoned the sub department head because he didn't know who to speak to <laughs> and then he phoned the teacher that was in charge of the ALTs and she told somebody else to tell me <laughs> it's so, a long way <laughs> so when they came when I went back to the office they went we've got a problem and then they called me into the office room and I sat down by that time I was super embarrassed that all these different people mm. had been told about it and I was being kind of signaled out so that's the kind of weird approach they take so there's no feeling of empathy about how you might feel yeah so that actually really annoyed me and i've never forgotten it you know the, the way that they did that uh, and I, you, i've seen similar things in the office environment as well are you the type of person that if somebody has like food in their teeth you just say hey you got food in your teeth yeah i'm like that too what about you me too but a lot of i think especially in japan i mean some of my american friends are like this too but especially in japan they won't say anything they'll just well, like mm. put up with it and well, tolerate it there's also risk mitigation so uh. for example if somebody at the school says to me oh your trousers are all saggy and stuff like that and i go ah and like go nuts <laughs> you know they've got to take responsibility for me going nuts <laughs> so in order to kind of like mitigate that yeah. they've told lots of people about it yeah but at the same time they've just upset me with something that could have been solved with a two-minute conversation and I would have gone, cool, no worries, sorry about that, you know. So there's this weird thing. And then also in the office environment as well, you know, um, you do get kind of siloed off to one side. And it's not necessarily, you know, something that happens by choice or whatever. It's not on purpose. By design, you know, but it does happen. Yeah. And um, yeah. I said me too, but it depends on the relationship. If I can tell, like we are close friends, I tell it directly, yeah. uh, but we are like apart. Yeah. I want, like I might tell people around you. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Like I think the the mitigation of responsibility and like the, the, the... so I had a situation when I was working for the BOE and like uh, it says clearly in my contract that I can own a car. So I went and bought a car. I didn't consult with my, my company at all because I was just like, why do you need to know if I have a car or not? Yeah. My 80-year-old boss got really, really angry that I had a car, brought me into his office and told me that I should get rid of my car because I'm American and I don't know how to drive in Japan. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, I'm not doing that. And I just left. Right. I was just like, shut up. It's not in my, in my contract. I don't appreciate this conversation. It's kind of racist. He, but I didn't say that to him. I was just like, okay. He's like, so sell your car. I'm like, no. And I was like, thank you. I just walked away, right? Yeah. DEF CON 4 happened in this office. Like all, everybody between me and him, he's a very, very top boss, was just like four people. We're all summoned into his office and sitting, pr standing prone, like mm. half bowing while he's yelling at them. Hmm. And I'm like watching this. I'm kind of bemused. I'm like, you know, as like a cultural experience. I'm just like looking at this from the side. I'm like, what's going on here? And then they all promised to make it better. But then they knew that I wasn't going to sell my car and that I have the right to have a car because it's in my contract. Hmm. And so they like, they like uh, rounded the, the corners on it. You know, like they like, they, they split the deal and they said, all right, we'll, we'll make sure that he gets insured and that he drives safely is what my bosses who have nothing to do with me owning a car promised the Ted boss yeah. and then he threw something at them and then kicked them out of his office and, and shut the door Aww. and I was like welcome to Japan Mitch I was <laughs> like <laughs> it, it, it happens in the family in families too like when kids do something bad yeah. daddy won't tell kids uh, directly yeah. daddy tell mommy to tell kids to do better really it, yeah huh that my father, was, my father was different. No, 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 but it does happen. It does happen. I know what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. Mm. And sometimes, here's the funniest thing. Sometimes, this is getting off topic, but sometimes if the kids are misbehaving in school, mm -hmm. the parents will go and tell the, the, the teacher, 
Why aren't you watching my kid? Why is he misbehaving in oh, school? Oh, that happens. They don't even tell the, their own son or daughter mm. that they're screwing up. They tell the t- it's weird. Mm. Yeah. But anyway, like, yeah, understanding that, like, oh, I, just getting back to my point that your company is going to kind of invade your private life a little bit in most mm. companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the health check as well, right? Health checks are They all... know so much crap about you. Yeah. Collected data as well. But, I mean, there's that kind of trade-off of responsibility, right? You provide information to them they look after you that's yeah. the idea um yeah but i do notice there's a lot of it's weird because if you're a foreigner in the office you, you are treated slightly differently and you do have freedoms that japanese people don't yeah because we have cheater mode right yeah like they're contained within like the, the the little sandbox in the video game but we can totally leave that and just do whatever we want <laughs> yeah. we call this gaijin smash it's like when you just like you want to do something but they're being so japanese about it that you just do it and then they just say, oh, because he's Gaijin, he did it. Mm. Yeah. It's not good, but it is a superpower that you guys should wield, like, responsibly. <laughs> and that does create some kind of aggressiveness in the office it, as well. It's animosity. It what? slowly will start building up that animosity towards you. So it's you. like, why do you get to get away with that? You know, yeah. we don't get that. But, it's true. You know, because you've got that freedom, you know, you can be more, it's just a weird way of saying it, but you can be more foreign about your work mm. and then do things that, you know, people in the office might not have thought of. Yeah. You know, so it's like an experimentation. So there's this thing like there's this guy called Rory Sutherland who's like an ad uh, man or whatever from London and he like there's lots of talks on the web and shit and he's saying like bees like 80% of bees go to the same location to get the honey yeah. from the flowers because mm. it's definitely going to work and they have this thing called the waggle dance where they dance and yeah, show they, the other they, bees yeah they can right? communicate with each other where by dancing go. yeah mm. so they all know where to go they all go there and do it mm. and it's some percentage of bees like I think it might be 20 or less or something mm. like that that totally ignore instructions completely mm. and just fly off randomly. Mm. And their job is to find new honey sources. Mm. So if they all followed the dance and all did what they were told, mm-hmm. that honey source would eventually disappear. Mm. Or that pollen source would eventually disappear and everybody would die. Mm-hmm. And these 20% fail an awful lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when they strike gold, you know, they get a whole new source of pollen yeah. for mm-hmm. making honey again. So in Japan, being in that 20% is very, very difficult. Mm. It's also you know? scary too. We yeah. talked about this before with like Giri Haji, like, you know, risk is uh, something that usually people avoid because, you know, there's shame associated with things like yeah. that. In Silicon Valley, failure is almost celebrated. Mm. I mean, we see, we look at Apple, Google, we look at these big companies in Silicon Valley, but we don't have those companies because they we only have successes we have those companies because we have a million failures that you never saw yeah yeah you know how many other online retailers came before and after amazon right we just remember amazon because they were the successful ones Mm. but they were willing to fail and that's why we got them right Mm. yeah so that goes to your 20 percent that of the bees that go out try to find pollen but then fail or die or whatever you know so i mean i'm in a way i understand that my role at the company i work at is the kind of weirdo doing lots of different (laughs) things yeah Um, but that's afforded me the opportunity to do things that wouldn't normally be able to be done you know and i've been able to push through change as well you know we're bitching a lot but i bet you 100 100 bucks that if you walked into your company you could probably pick out like four or five people that you would definitely drink with and really close yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, and those those bonds are, especially when you get into the company, you become kind of their family, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And you can make those close, close interper- uh, interpersonal relationships with the other people in your company that you probably otherwise wouldn't have if you stayed in an only foreigner environment in Japan. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it's to do with the activities they did together as well. So, you know, generally it's hard to get people in Japan to do something new. I mean, it's very, very difficult. Unless everybody else is already doing the new thing. To start, yeah. If somebody starts doing it, then everybody joins in but you know if there's a job right in front of you that needs doing like cleaning is a prime example Mm. because everybody in japan a knows how to clean and b knows that if you clean something up nobody's going to get angry at you yeah all right generally right so if there's a cleaning job everybody piles in and does it yeah in fact so many people come there there are loads of people stood around doing nothing yeah just holding a broom (laughs) right and in that situation i just go fuck this i'm sorry i'm gonna yeah, go yeah. sit down because like i don't need to be here i'm not useful in this situation yeah, so i'm yeah. off and if you do that they think oh god he's lazy you yeah know? he's not part of the group right you know there is that, that that side of it too um the other side is like you know if you've got a new idea something that needs to be challenged and you don't know if it's going to work or not but it might might be quite good mm. people won't get behind you and it's really hard to get people to to give their time for that um because they can't calculate the risk one and secondly, as a foreign person, you're a, an unknown entity. So they don't quite know what you're going to do. 
Yeah, you're you not, know. you're, you know, you behave in, in different patterns than like that they're used to. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a question mark, right? So that's uncertainty. Yeah, and obviously uncertainty. Japanese people don't like uncertainty. Yeah. And if you do something different that the foreign dude said, you might get told off as well. Yeah. So my thing now is to start things, do them. Um, and then just dump them on people. <laughs> and I, they tend to get better then. You know you what? Know? You know what I really enjoy is having in around me that foreign experienced Japanese person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The person who's like, if you ever seen Blade, who can like, he's like, he's like half vampire, so he can walk in the sunlight, but he can also, he's like oh, yeah, super yeah. powerful, like a vampire. He's got best of both worlds. Yeah, that's what these Japanese people are like. They they understand the foreign culture. They've worked abroad. They understand, you know, what it's like to work with with uh, global people. Mm. And at the same time. They also understand what it's like to be a Japanese person, so they yeah. can just adapt. Mm. Yeah. They can connect to you, mm -mm. and they get the 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 irritating, annoying part things of both sides. Mm. Yeah, those people are a diamond dozen, uh, not a diamond. They're they're a diamond in the rough. But when you find them, oh my god, they are great. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's Japanese people who are super innovative as well. Don't yeah. get me wrong. I mean, you don't have to be going to a foreign country or something. But those people tend to be a bit wacky. They're not normal. I do like them though. They're, you know, they're insane people, and I love them. So we kept saying it before, like you know, Deruku you are. It's to do mm. the nail that sticks out gets the hammer so some nails stick out so far you can't hammer them you know? and <laughs> that's a those, good way of putting that those people do really cool stuff yeah mm. so you know like my zawa zozo mm. um like uniqlo's founder and stuff like yeah, that yeah you know? yeah these people are just like innovative you know maverick types mm. and they do really well right? there are we do see some innovations in japan that are just really unique and they're very clever um you know and i think that even in especially in the entertainment industry a lot of their movies americans have just straight copied them yeah i mean coming out soon is godzilla versus king kong godzilla is a japanese property that america mm. went we could make money with this yeah. <laughs> and just stole it if you if you guys watch for example the magnificent seven is a cowboy movie and then before you watch that, watch The Seven, Seven Samurai, mm. which is a movie that was produced before The Magnificent mm. Seven in Japan. It's a one-to-one -one copy. They just replaced sa uh, Samurai with cowboys. Yeah, but Kurosawa Akira was influenced by John Ford and yeah. his kind of westerns as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's a cycle. Yeah, it's, it goes it's cyclical, yeah, yeah. all the way around. So Kurosawa's actually criticized because people said his movies are too western. Mm. Really? In Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of the shots he was doing and stuff like but that. But it's it's iconic. It's it's, it's survived yeah. you know the 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 ages and. But, but anyway, the, those long shots like now to us look super Japanese. Really? But, but he was copying like John Ford and you know searches and stuff like that. I think. Well, was, I mean, we yeah. we could get into like you know spaghetti westerns and stuff like that, yeah. where like the movie industry just does that kind of stuff. But yeah. Anyway, um, I think I want to I want to close today's show, or before I mean, we might go to the comments if we have time. But I want to I want to get on. Lastly, what do you guys think the future of Japan is going to look like? Because you know, I think that more foreign people are going to move here, work here, enjoy the culture. The because you know, living here is actually really really good. I, mean, we, I think we all love living yeah, here. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think is in store? Natsuki, I'm going to go to you first because you work with young people in Japanese companies. Do you think that there's going to be a increase in foreign people going forward? In forward, yes, because Japanese population is shrinking. Sh shrinking. Mm -hmm. So, but it takes a lot of time, mm. I guess, because uh, one problem is like language yeah. because we cannot communicate with each other, and also, like you said, like old people, like back to young people. Yeah, Do you understand yeah, yeah. what I mean? They have problem, you know, get used to the new thing or people change is going to be difficult yeah change yeah. can be difficult so. but do you, but you but you see more global people moving yes, here and, yes, and working here definitely okay. definitely alex what's your take on it i think it's going to take time it's like a learning process you know britain did immigration after the second world war but, yeah, came. it's still going on it's like a back and forth even now with yeah, Brexit yeah. and everything right yeah. i think i think i think immigration has been good for every country yeah but there's not there's a lot of people that don't think that. So you've got to get ready for it, right? Yeah. You've got to understand that you know d d diverse people are going to come and live in your country. They're going to have different requirements, different needs, and you can't just say, well, you've got to become a hundred percent, you know, British, a hundred percent, whatever, when you live in that country. Could you imagine? Thing, if, could you imagine if if all the people with all their different cultures and all their different foods came to your country and then forgot how to make those foods and just started eating eating English food the whole time? How boring! My, my God! How boring! No, stop Would slagging off English food. It's good. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the weird thing is that, like, you know, how do I explain it? In America, you don't ever get said to, you've got to become American, right? Some people do say that, but they're idiots. But what is, it, you know, what <laughs> yeah, is well, American, right? Native American, I yeah, guess. <laughs> nobody knows. So, you know, that's a, that's the idea, yeah. but it's not being carried out very well, obviously. Um, but going forward, I don't think people moving here will have to become Japanese, mm. but you've got to understand, mm. you know, the Japanese society mm. and language as well, obviously. 
um, and way of doing things too. You studied the language and the culture, and I think that it's helped you so much in your business yeah. life because you understand the needs mm. of the people you're talking to. But because I've gone more than halfway, yeah. I want people to come and meet me. A little bit. You know, at least 70%, you mm. know, 30% of the way from their side yeah. and my 70 yeah. And if they're not willing to do that, I don't have time for them because, mm. you know, it, you've got to understand that we've overcome huge hurdles to, mm. to come here and make a living here. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I've heard there are many exchange students who are studying in Japanese college mm -hmm. and they're willing to get Japanese company's job mm. and they do the job hunting just like other Japanese students, but they're so hard to get job. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're going to hire somebody that's going to fit into a Japanese worker mold, why would you hire a foreign person? Just hire a Japanese person. Just hire a Japanese right, right, right. person. doesn't make any sense. And then, uh, especially like tourist industry or like hotels, you know, those exchange students are able to get a job. Because uh, they're working with customers from all over the world. Right, right, yeah. right, right. But, but current situation, right, there's not a lot of those jobs Current right situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot with agriculture as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people coming in from like Vietnam. And so, so you got both the top and the bottom of yeah. the economy. Blue you know, collar, you know. Yeah, the blue collar workers are definitely coming. And, and if you go to the islands here and where we live in Kagoshima, you see nothing but you know, um, you know, other Asian country immigrants that are working the fields, which is important because if they're not doing that, mm. you know, it's the same thing that's going on in America. When people say, you know, we don't like a immigration in America. I'm like, who do you think is working the fields, guys? Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not the lazy Americans that are doing it, mm. you know? And so the immigration can be good as long as it's, you know, like you said, you're prepared for it. Right. You've got to take care of those people too. You've got to Absolutely. understand that they're going to have needs that are different, you know, they're not necessarily going to be able to adapt yeah. well. Yeah. Right, right. So you've got to look out for that and try and support yeah. them in a way. Yeah. And that's, I think yeah. there are a lot of places in Japan that are doing that, guys. And 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 I want to go back and, and talk about Tokyo a little bit. Tokyo and like major metropol metropolitan areas. Uh, even Fukuoka and Osaka, they have these kind of mixed hybrid companies that are both Japanese and foreign, global looking, you know, startups and things like that. So it's an easier like entry now than it was 10, 15, 20 years mm. ago. But now I see a lot of people in convenience stores in Tokyo from different countries like yeah. Nepal, whatever, right, right, you know, right. Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And I never know what to speak to them in that's what language. So, okay, it's that's, weird because it's like they can do the konbini yeah. Japanese, right? You, you speak Japanese, right? To them. Usually because no? mm -hmm. they speak but to me But sometimes they Japanese. talk to you in English, right? Especially if they're like, they know English. They're yeah. like, hey. And you're like, hi. And you're like, whoa, what up? Hi. And then it becomes weird because they don't know how to do the their job in interaction English. Yeah, in English. So there, it's like this isn't in the manual. There, oh. There's a there's a curry shop here, and it's uh where are they from? It's not India, Sri Lanka, Sri, Lanka, Sri mm. Lankan curry. And I, I've gone there with Josh many times, and every time I walk in there, I'm like, I don't know how to talk to them. <laughs> yeah. Do we speak to them in English? Do we speak to them in Japanese? But then sometimes they'll speak to me in Japanese, so I'll respond in Japanese. Mm -hmm. So it's a yeah. really crappy Japanese conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if they talk to me in English, I'll speak to them in English. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, it's weird knowing the default language. Right? It's interesting though. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's the interesting stuff that I want people to experience going forward. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, Josh, do we have any any comments? That we want? Nope. Okay, let's go. Cool. Wait, wait, wait. We do. We got some comments. They're small. I can't read them. Uh, but yeah, doing these live shows, one of the things, guys, that we you know we can start doing is like you know doing the interactions between the audience a little bit. So if you guys have questions while we're doing a live show, just hit it up in the chat. And if we have time to get to it, we'll definitely get to it. Uh, uh, okay. I so okay. Yeah, so somebody saw somebody at a convenience store shouting at a foreign staff member because they took the stamps from the wrong place and yeah. the employee didn't seem to understand it. I can imagine that happening, you know. Um, mm. You know, it's hard to tell when somebody's learning like a rote job like that. So you repeat the same phrases over and over again. If you make a mistake, mm. you know, it's hard to remember how much the person understands and doesn't understand. So you've got to be flexible with it, right? That's not I good. won't send that manager to the falling country. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send him there and yeah. say, you, you work in a convenience mm. store abroad and see how hard mm. it is. Yeah. yeah. The, the, and you know, I want to say that working in a convenience store is a high pressure job, especially when they get rushed. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. I mean, it can be a lot of stress. And I, I feel so lucky that those people are working there when, mm. my, when I, my drunk ass comes in, they're looking for a sandwich at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like... They're like my personal god. I'm like, thank you so much for being here, you know. Uh, but yeah, that kind of, you know, what is it? Bullying at the workplace. That's uh, yeah. unfortunately like a, a thing that needs to be removed from Japanese society. It still happens sometimes. Like bosses will get angry at Japanese people too. But the comment like kind, you got to be kind, right? Yeah. Kindness. Because you can, if somebody's from your country, your background, maybe you can imagine what 
they might be going through and if they're from a different place you might not be able to imagine as easily what problems they have yeah imagine if if you try yeah imagine if your son went to a foreign country and some guy in that foreign country was screaming at him because he didn't he didn't understand you know that's the kind of attitude that you need to have like if this was my son or daughter how Mm. would i want them to be treated Mm. yeah Mm. I mean, just basic human stuff. Mm. Right? Well, just growing pains, right? I think Japan will be all right in the future. I, I think, think if I saw that, I would probably butt in and tell that manager to stop. Yeah, I'd, tell, <laughs> yeah, I'd butt in, definitely. I'd but, butt in too. But there are, there's a couple of Izakayas here where, where we live and they hire, I see a lot of Nepalese, but um, the they are like a beloved part of the staff. You know, they're just like, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, there's some Chinese and there's, I think a Taiwanese person that I've met once and like all these different countries. And like, for the most part, I think they get treated really well here yeah i don't know about other places yeah. but you know don't don't think that that's the norm that's not the norm i don't think me person is mean to everyone yeah they probably Japanese like that with the japanese yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah um i think that if if you are going to come uh live here though i would definitely study about the con- the the culture the history and then the language because it's really easy to make friends if you speak the same language and mm-hmm. you're the same culture and if you're an employer, learn about your employee's background and country as well. That's yeah. your responsibility if you're going to hire foreign staff. That's true. That's yeah. true. If you want to hire foreign staff, you got to be respectful of them. You know, I, I'm lucky enough to work to, to manage a, a corporation that hires people from all over the world, and it's interesting to see the different dynamics between different people. And but bu- bridge building between those people is, is my job mm. as management. So um, if if they're not if they're not getting along, I have to intervene. I have to change something about it. Mm. So. But yeah, um, anyway, guys, we're going to end this live broadcast. If you guys have comments or anything afterwards, because the, the live broadcasts stay up uh, afterwards, you can watch them at your at your uh, convenience. Uh, just leave us a comment. We do read the comments. We uh, really do get excited when you guys subscribe, when you like our, our show. So please do that. Uh, or, you know, we also have an audio podcast, an Apple podcast with the same name. If you guys will just want to watch or listen to the audio version, that's cool, too. Uh, or if you guys want us to do any future topics, just let us know in the comment section. Okay. All right. All right, guys. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks for everything. Bye, Bye. guys. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Small Talk Japan. Small Talk Japan is recorded at Story Studios in Kagoshima. This podcast stars Michi, Natsuki, and Alex, and is produced by me, Josh, and is executive produced by Michi. If you like the show, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review and let us know what you think. Thank you again, and until next week, bye!